I want to uh, introduce to you all our esteemed guest panel today. I'm really happy and excited to have um, everyone here with us and um, would like to, to begin with some introductions. Uh, let's see, Bonnie, would you like to begin? I see you first. Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm Bonnie Odahomsey. I'm third generation Japanese American from Hawaii. And I want, today I'm wearing glasses. My hair is dark because I just got it colored. I just turned 70 years old and am a proud grandmother finally. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. And how about you, Rayo? Hi everyone, it's lovely to be here. My name is Rael Dorfman and I'm the Executive Director of the Dance Resource Center, which is the local dance service organization in Greater Los Angeles. I am wearing a turquoise blue top. Unlike Bonnie, I have not had my hair done in what pandemic span, so a year and a half. So my blonde is growing out, brown at the top, blonde at the bottom, unintentionally so. Um, and I have brown eyes and I'm currently wearing a big smile. Um, yes, and that's, that's Thanks so much, Rael. Next, I'd like to introduce everyone to Andrea Spearman. Hi, Andrea. Hello, all. Uh, my name is Andrea Spearman. Pronouns are she, her. I am a light brown skinned Black woman with green eyes. Uh, my dark brown hair is currently in twists. Today, I'm wearing a red dress with gold and red accessories. I am a multi-hyphenated artist, administrator, podcast host, et cetera. Uh, currently, I work with Dancers Group in San Francisco as artist resource manager, connecting our local community with dance and movement specific events, activities, and opportunities. Wonderful, thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce everyone to Molly Haven Miller. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here. My name's Molly Miller. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, I am a white woman with brown eyes, wearing glasses, with light brown hair and a light brown top sitting against a light brown wall. So I kind of blend in. <laughs> I'm just realizing that. Um, I am a dancer, dance educator, but primarily spend most of my um, dance related time as the executive director of Dance Source Houston, which is the service organization for the Houston area. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled to be part of today's discussion. Thanks. Thanks so much, Molly. Next, I'd like to introduce everyone to uh, Janae Lynch. Hi, Janae. Hi everyone, my name is Janae Lynch and I'm a senior business rep at SAG-AFTRA in the music department. I handle contract education and enforcement for singers and dancers and music videos for all performers. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm coming to you from my home office in Huntington Beach, California. I office out of the national office um, of SAG-AFTRA in Los Angeles, California. I am biracial mixed, black and white. I'm second generation Irish on my mother's side and recently just found out I am Nigerian by the powers of B of ancestor DNA on my father's side. Um, I have curly golden brown hair with bangs. Um, I'm wearing a black top and a happy smile to be here. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Janae. And next, uh, I'd like to introduce everyone to Emily Running. Hi, Emily. Hi, thanks, Sophia. My name is Emily Running. I am the founder, vision director, and strategic partnerships lead with Dancewire in Portland, Oregon. Um, I am Norwegian descent with a blonde asymmetrical haircut and a dusty rose sweater with big white dots and very long triangular shaped earrings. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Emily. And next I'd like to introduce Gustavo Herrera. Welcome, Gustavo. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Gustavo Herrera. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Arts for LA. Um, I am coming to you from West Covina, uh, California, Tongva land. 
uh, he, him, his, uh, identify as Latin X. I am, let's see, black hair, brown skin, wearing a white shirt uh, and a blue sweater. And just really, really excited to be here with you all. Thanks, Gustavo. And lastly, I would love to introduce everyone to Nick Brentley. Hi, Nick. Thanks, Sophia. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Brentley, he, him pronouns. I'm zooming in from Rame to land, currently known as San Francisco. I'm an African-American male with short curly hair, wearing a black v-neck t-shirt underneath a blue denim button-down that's open, as well as a small brown choker. In my background are gathered curtains in a shallow bay window next to a dress form with a colorful shirt and suspended belts on both sides. I am a freelance dancer, uh, but I'm also a stage and production manager for Bandaloop, a vertical dance company out of Oakland, as well as Velocity Circus, which is a circus here in San Francisco. But for today's meeting, I'm, I'm here on behalf of Dance Artists National Collective, a group of freelance dance artists like myself, uh, also known as DANC or DANC. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for introducing yourselves and really excited to dive into this conversation with you all. So the first question um, at hand, and I'll put this into the chat too, so all of us participants and panelists can be revisiting it um, throughout. But this first question is, you know, how have dancers in the Western region been impacted by the pandemic um, and these times in the last couple, couple of years? Um, and how have they been responding? What changes or adaptations have you noticed in dance, whether it be education, production, performance, virtual festivals or touring, any, any and all of the above? So I'd like to just open it up and um, each panelist will have a couple minutes to share. And I'll start with you, Bonnie. I know you did some research in looking at this kind of big picture in, in, in the national scope. Yeah, I think, thank you, Sophia. So, you know, I, I'm wearing my philanthropist hat at the moment. And I think that one of the lar the big picture items is the fact that we have now, grants makers and the arts, et cetera, have really centered uh, and focused on inequality, uh, which is, is something that really has needed addressing. And so just last year, for example, we saw the $1.7 billion that came from five arts funders that was to support uh, nonprofits in the wake of the pandemic, followed by $156 million with this new America's Cultural Treasures Initiative. Uh, and what this has really uh, done is helped organizations that have been historically uh, marginalized or underfunded, underrepresented to really have a better shot. I'm going to wear my practitioner hat for a second. The other um, observation I've made in talking to some across my stakeholder network is the fact that this has really been an opportunity for independent artists and companies to refresh mission and to look at how they might strategically organize ex and expand income flow streams. And the last piece is repositioning the importance of financial asset cushions and then making sure that that cushion is replenished and not depleted. So those are just some takeaways. Hmm. Thank you for that. This was in incredible some of the funding that came in in the form of COVID relief for, for artists and, um, and arts organizations. I'll just go in the order of, of our introductions. Um, Rael, uh, what do you see as, as um, in the Los Angeles region in particular, dancers have been impacted and responding? So I think um, there's been some drastic changes and it depends on what lens you're looking through, which is what um, Bonnie um, uh, was speaking of, I think there's the independent contractor here in Los Angeles who relies heavily on project to project work, um, or, you know, the, it's either the teacher or the performer. And when the pandemic hit, the financial flow completely stopped. And for those working project to project, this can be quite drastic because there's no um, structure in place for benefits or support. 
Um, but I do think that lent itself to new endeavors, new avenues of uh, working, whether it was providing online programming or um, creating new products. We saw a lot of new merch production and those sorts of things. So dancers reinvented themselves to keep up with what was happening around them. And then there's a small to mid-sized dance company. Um, but that kind of was counter to what we were seeing with the independent contractor. Um, a lot more general operating support became available to those companies, which was not available before the pandemic. It was very uh, driven and geared towards project-based uh, work or restricted uh, grant support. And we saw a lot of the restricted grant support uh, become unrestricted. Companies were able to use their um, grant funds for general operating support, which had a significant impact, uh, not only for the current year, but I think looking towards next year and beyond. Um, and I think the challenge there is gonna be how to sustain and grow because this new, this new funding has never been um, in place before. Thanks so much, Rael, for bringing forward that, um, you know, uh, how, how this really impacted, especially independent contractors or dancers, um, you know, and, and the lack of, of social support, um, you know, and, the, and, and as the loss of work, uh, you know, how, how dancers who are working independently were, were able to, to manage. How about you, Andrea, in San Francisco? What have you noticed in the past year and a half with dancers? Well, Dancers Group specifically conducted a survey at the start of the pandemic last year um, in May. And at that point, the financial loss was in the millions. And one observation that we took away was that artists and organizations were experiencing, experiencing loss at different levels at a financial income point of view, loss of opportunities, loss of connection with each other. And since then, you know, people have amazingly been able to switch over to online classes, online performances, outdoor classes and performances. And some people have actually taken this time to pause their performance work and really dive into research, um, dive into education, dive into one-on-one -on -one mentorship and really kind of slow down and re reshape and reobserve and refresh, you know, as Bonnie said, their missions reshape what they stood for as an artist and really taking that time to slow down and really take care of home. And additionally, we've seen an uptick in people starting archiving their work. Uh, as individual artists and as organizations. Thanks for bringing that forward, that the shift to, to virtual and to outdoor performances and, and taking a beat to reassess um, mission, vision and values as an artist. Um, those are all really important. How about, how about for you, Molly, in Texas and specifically the Houston region, region what have you noticed um, among dancers there? Yeah, so, so early pandemic, um, be because of the uh, months delay with Texas, getting the unemployment system set up for freelance workers um, to to receive any benefits. Um, that the the delay I can't remember how long the delay was, but I, I know it was it was significant for workers whose entire income um, is is based on project um, and freelance work. So that that was very dire um, here for, for all arts workers. Um, and, and a lot of dance artists who who their you know their portfolio careers uh, have have roles that that are outside of the dance field or or sort of tangentially attached. Um, and we we saw a lot of artists, you know, sort of bolster their side photography business or go all in with a new Pilates certification or something that they could they could still do, they knew they could maintain for the extended duration of the pandemic while earning income, but still being able to be in control of their own safety and feeling like they they had the ability to um, you know to create those those limitations. Um, so we 
we saw a lot of that. Um, and we've also seen more, more sharing of resources, be it space or mm -hmm. shared productions, um, things that happened before, but are just so necessary now um, to, to share what resources are available. Um, and yeah, and, and I also just to, to second what's been said here too, the, the ability to pause and for organizations to really think about the long term development for a project instead of making sure that they have a show out in six months um, and being able to, to plan for maybe a 12 or 18 month um, development of a work and for 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 dancers to to feel empowered to to turn down some projects and, and only take on the ones that they really feel um, you know, safe and and supported in, um, I think has been another another outcome of this. Yeah, that's really, um, you know, so interesting. The observation, just the the sharing of space. I know a lot of um, there, there's a lot of open source already. In, you know, in, in various artist communities of of, of um, sharing resources and through you know cooperative space or collective. And it's it's so great to hear that that was happening more and more um, throughout. And to your point about dancers kind of leaning on other um, sideline careers or businesses to supplement their income, um, I was reminded of Andrea's earlier point that some dancers were using this time to go back to school and getting retrained and re-upped on other skill sets, transferable skills. But I really, I just wanted to um, acknowledge, you know, in, in our chat, Amado says, yes, you know, I'm still waiting on my benefits. And so to your point too, Molly, about ju just the challenges of accessing Puya or, you know, unemployment benefits for independent contractors was incredibly challenging for many. And, and even, you know, for some um, immigrant or undocumented artists, that wasn't even, you know, an option. So um, yeah, re all really important points. So how about you, Janae? I know at, at SAG-AFTRA working with union dancers, what have you noticed over the course of these last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic definitely hit the uh, TV film side very roughly. We were you know, very shut down for about five months, but within those five months, we saw producers um, get very creative and how that they could keep their productions up and also provide entertainment in some sort of way for all of us that were, you know, stuck at home. So we saw a lot of um, self taping and some of them got really great at creating. So where they edited it to where everyone looked like they were in the same space. So you had two different things that you were seeing. You were either seeing edits where people were in their home, which was great, or you saw them be very creative and make it and edit it to where everyone seemed like they were in the same space. So that was really great. Um, and then we also saw producers really taking the pandemic seriously and doing things to incorporate mask wearing and, um, you know, social distancing in their work as well, incorporated in the work that they were doing. So I think it also gave a different aspect of you can keep continuing to do what you love to do, um, but be safe and practice being safe in the pandemic, which, which was really great to see as well. Um, what we also saw was our members really taking advantage of the opportunities that we have available to them, um, such as, you know, how to navigate social media, building your own brand, how that branches out into other opportunities and entertainment for you. And we saw people really grasp that. And another great thing that we saw just going to, you know, what um, Molly and Rael and Andrea said was we saw dancers helping dancers. It was something that we really saw the commercial dance world really just jump into and sitting in promoting other people's classes and whatnot. So we saw a, a larger expansion of, um, you know, teaching happening, but then also activity teaching. I call it activity teaching would be, you know, yoga, pilo, things of that nature. I call it activity because who wants to call it exercise? It should be fun. Um, so we saw an increase of that too, where the dancers were tapping into other revenues that they had under their belt with certifications that they had. And we saw a huge expansion of that. So um, it definitely uh, brought in what people were able to do and still keep some type of revenue coming in during the pandemic. And now as we're kind of in this elongated part of it, we are seeing tours coming back up and being very careful of what spaces they're being in and, um, 
we're also seeing that in TV film as well. We're seeing a lot of dance pumped into these productions, which is great to see. So, you know, it, it started out rough, but we're getting back in there. Yeah, thanks for, you know, bringing that up and just how touring and production has been adapting and, and with, you know, the different COVID protocols and, and safety precautions, how that's been building up and changing, you know, over the course of, of these times. And also I, I saw Emily uh, nodding her head as you were talking about, you know, branding and, um, and all this, um, you know, how, how has that also been the case in Portland, Emily? Have you seen dancers really stepping into that more these days, these times? Um, a little bit. I think, um, yeah, I have comments in a few different buckets. I think one of them is really about prioritizing. <laughs> so looking at, we all know the dancers tend to have just very expansive schedules. Um, they do a lot of, a lot of different things, have many, many different jobs usually. And I think that I've seen a lot of prioritizing happening as well. So really taking a look at what, what were the things that I wanted to be doing and what were the things that I was just doing because it was, it was, it kind of came about and was happening for me. So that was, um, that's one bucket. I think um, another bucket that I wanted to comment on was a season change. So in sunny and rainy Portland, Oregon, suddenly <laughs> um, the, everybody was looking at the, sunny months as when when they're planning for their performances so that it could be outdoors. So we usually have a September to September to May season of performances, a lot happening in October, a lot happening in March and April. And now I think that we're seeing a lot of people trying to find outdoor spaces and find other places um, and so that's kind of unique or not unique, but to a region <laughs> with our climate. Um, along with that, it's interesting that I think potentially a benefit is that dance is coming up in different places. So instead of just in theaters, dance is um, coming up in outdoor locations, in just other settings. So people are having to be really creative. And I think that audiences are actually enjoying that. Um, they're, they're finding it interesting to see dance in locations that are other than just a theater. So I hope that that's something that we continue to um, expand upon even, even as, um, although with that, I will say that now climate change is also a really big factor for us with the heat and the fires and all of the smoke and suddenly that season, so we're kind of split, we're kind of struggling in that way in that the rainy season isn't that great and then now the outdoor season because of the pandemic and now the outdoor season because of climate related activity is is really struggling so we'll you know we'll have to see where that goes um i wanted to make one other point kind of going back to bonnie and the philanthropy change so and and some of the other panelists as well talked about that i think um what we saw is more general operating support. We saw more grants that were previously restricted just opened up so that the funders said, hey, whatever you had this for, just use it for whatever you need right now. We're not gonna ask you to report back on your project specific um, because often the project went out the window but they were able to keep the money. Um, and then we also saw foundations work together to create a pooled fund. And that was an interesting experiment and concept that, um, you know, had its had its pros and cons. But I think is, I think that moving in a direction of trying to find um, different ways for funders to support as well is really important. Those are yeah, just that that shift from project based to general operating, and how that made a big difference that time during this time and even the shared um, funding models, it's really interesting um, approach. And I, I know a lot of dance um, companies also benefited from not necessarily having a direct correlation between their budget size and having it be a percentage of um, that total. So, and 
thanks for making this point about the seasonal uh, the seasonal impact of, you know, when it's even possible to have performances, you know, during a summer season when some, you know, dance companies would typically be dark or on, on their breaks, right? So um, super, super interesting uh, shifts and wonder if that will continue, you know, as we move forward, but exploring um, offstage venues for performance seems like a direction that has been and will continue. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Gustavo, I know your perspective in Arts for LA um, as, is, includes dance and the other performing arts. What have you seen as some trends and does it kind of reflect what folks are sharing in terms of dance here? And I, I do have to, to say, before I even begin to respond to that, that we, Arts for LA, because we're representing all the different disciplines, of the arts and culture field, we really lean on Rael and the DRC, the Dance Resource Center for their incredible work in organizing and mobilizing the dance community here in Los Angeles. Uh, we, we support uh, Rael's work wherever we can, but with, with the breadth of disciplines that we're tasked with, um, trying to serve, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible for us to serve in the way that Rael does. Uh, and does such a great job of doing. And so I, I do want to echo uh, what, what my colleagues have said here really around what we have heard from the dance community, both the professional dancers, the experience of um, professional dancers who are independent versus those who are affiliated with the company is very different. And when we think about dance organizations, uh, many of whom are members of, of Arts for LA also, um, you know, the experience of being able to comply with reopening guidelines and the ever-changing reopening guidelines across the city, the county, the state, uh, that looks different for small, mid, large organizations uh, with the availability of resources. Uh, and I think we also think about it from a dance, a dance student perspective, uh, because we do work with K through 12, uh, we do try and promote arts education, and we, we know educators, dance educators have had, it, it's been a road, um, you know, a journey uh, to learn how to translate that education to digital, but also for students, um, particularly low income students might not have the space uh, within their home to, to practice um, dance and so forth. And, and we have heard of students um, you know, with their educator practicing on the side of their street uh, with a cell phone. Um, these are the kind of kind of adaptations that we've seen students do also. But I do want to sort of zoom out if I can for just a second and share what we're seeing in the performing arts field um, generally. Uh, and I was looking at a study recently, a study called Return to the Stage, and I'll drop the link for us here. Uh, and it's a national study, and it says that performing arts workers are beginning to find employment, but one quarter are still furloughed or unemployed. And that number is more than four times the national unemployment. These are numbers as of July 2021 of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and nearly half of those who have secured work have actually found it outside of the performing arts field. And so the levers, quote unquote, levers of the field, that's, that's a big red flag for us. Uh, this same study found that more than a quarter of um, the performing arts workers have borrowed money and many workers have actually shifted down the income ladder. So something for us to be thinking about as a sort of general, um, general data. And what really struck me is really the, the, you know, it said the order of priorities among those who are choosing to stay in the performing arts field is consistent, regardless of race, gender, and years on the job. But among those likely to leave uh, were BIPOC respondents. And the reason that they cited Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC respondents, and the reason that they cited that they were leaving the field was for their well being. And so among all the groups of leavers, uh, earnings are the most commonly cited reason, but for BIPOC leavers, 
earnings come in third. That's after well being and after work environment. Thank you for bringing forward those statistics and highlighting highlighting that for us and and really you know the um, and Bonnie I see your hand raised um, how the pandemic has has exacerbated social and economic inequalities and inequities that were there before and made it um, really made it made it much harder. Um, so it's uh, for for like you said, uh, low low income youth and and adult artists, um, Black Indigenous people of color that are in dance um, and and have dance arts careers. So yes, Bonnie, um, would you like to quickly respond? Yes, thank you, Gustavo. You know, one of the for twenty years I was chair of dance for the Princess Grace Foundation, so I checked in with some of my people just to sort of see where it's at. And I, I agree that um, self-care and wellness has all of a sudden taken, taken on a different kind of importance and priority for both independent artists as well as within companies. And that really came through the need to be better communicators within the organization, for the constituents, for the staff, for the board, et cetera. It's how we communicate and how we are sharing information and sharing care of each other. So that's one thing. The other trend that I've really noticed, and this is particularly for small to mid-sized dance companies, is that the type of dancers they hire will perhaps come with a different set of what I call ancillary skills. So these are a combination of hard and soft skills why? Because they can't afford to have expanded staff. And so if there are certain skill sets and, and um, passion and interests in areas of community engagement, arts education, you know, social media, technology, I think that that's the important part. And, and the last point is that, you know, through the different annual conferences that I've attended, so it's Grants Makers in the Arts, Dance USA, recently National Dance Education Organization, um, is the, the, the whole piece of capacity building has all of a sudden become elevated, is that we cannot strengthen our, our um, you know, art form unless we really pay attention to who is getting access to uh, capacity building resources, funds, and just networking in general. So, you know, my, my last bit is just to thank each of you uh, on behalf of the greater art form for what you do as our service organizations, because this is really the key. Thanks for that. And thanks again, Gustavo, for bringing this forward. There's a lot of um, uh, folks in the chat. Thank you for your um, for your sharing and your responses. And I feel like this is um, going to lead us really nicely into our, our next question about how do we um, how do we increase access, equity, and inclusion as a dance field and in our dance uh, regional communities uh, moving forward? But before we do, I want to make sure that Nick, you have a chance to to weigh in on this um, first question. What have you been noticing, both as a dancer and within Dank um, uh, in San Francisco and beyond? Thanks, Sophia. There's so many great points that have been brought up. Uh, I wish I could echo everybody else. Um, yes, there was there was a pivoting to the virtual platform for performing, rehearsing, teaching. There is a pivoting to outdoor spaces, site-specific work. I've done a mix of both. Uh, but I, I think it's important to return to the beginning of the pandemic when there was an established hierarchy of who was necessary. And artists and obviously dancers were at the very bottom. We are the least essential and therefore the last that will be fully returning to work. And so when you take that and you juxtapose it with being in a place like San Francisco that is extremely expensive while also being a dance hub, there's, there's, a, there's a cat and mouse uh, dichotomy of like, how do, how? How do I stay afloat in this expensive city not being able to do what has barely kept me afloat this entire time? Uh, also add to that, around a year ago, 
uh, when the forest fires were raging and we were breathing smoke for weeks, a lot of people fled. They left the state to be elsewhere. A lot of people left the state to quarantine with older relatives um, indefinitely. A lot of those people never came back. So in addition to pivoting to alternative ways of exploring dance, but also pivoting to completely different industries. I can say that. Uh, I still dance, but at, at this point, uh, back of house responsibilities is what supports me. Um, there's this question of, okay, what, what do we do? Uh, Andrea alluded to it, Molly alluded to it, to it uh, this pause that the pandemic caused the whole world to stop and reassess what are we doing as a society? How are we living? And in terms of, 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 of dance, what is working and what is not working? How do we make this a, a sustainable way to live? Because we're, we're going to have to do things differently in order to change how it used to be. There's a lot of people who, who want to return to before the pandemic and dancers are like, no, 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 <laughs> that wasn't working. That was not working at all. This is an opportunity for us to change how we operate. And so out of that came a really um, uh, enthusiastic surgeons to join an organization like Dank that is, that is advocating for uh, not, just, not just fair wages, but a living wage, even a thriving wage. Um, fair, fair working conditions, equitable pay, um, so that it can be a, a profession that is sustainable and respectable. I think there's this, there's a belief and acceptance within society that being a dancer is hard, and it is, but there are other professions that are hard. Being a doctor is hard, being an engineer is hard, but being a dancer is hard, it's, it's risky, it is it is short-lived, it is competitive. It's a lot of things that make it very unappealing to most people, and there's a complacency with it being that way. And so Dan uh, Dank is really, is really aiming to shift that by introducing standards within the industry that are currently lacking, in a nutshell. Thank you for your, your important work in, in doing, in, in protecting dancers safety and and labor rights and um i know you know and you as well uh, Jeanne. um but really you know like you said nick how how does it look like to have dance be a sustainable career that centers the well-being of of all dancers and um and yeah, I hear you. There's been a lot of people that have left California, particularly. Um, I don't know about the other states, but certainly there's, and we don't know if folks will come back. Um, but, you know, so this, the housing crisis here in, in LA and San Francisco, um, and I think both, both of you, Nick and Gustavo just spoke really to a lot of the pre-pandemic social inequities that existed within dance that um, now have just been exacerbated. How do we, like you said, dance? a lot of dancers have told me to, I don't wanna go back to the way it was pre-pandemic. I can't, I can't, I can't thrive in that environment. So moving forward, what does it look like for us to imagine a new, you know, whatever post pandemic really means or that new norm, whatever, but you know, what does that look like? What, what do we need it to look like so that it, it, it is more equi equitable and just and, and accessible and inclusive. So I'm going to um, put this next question into our chat. Patch, I know has to leave. Patch, would you like to just, um, I don't know if you're still available, um, but if you'd like to say something before you have to, have to leave us. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to take talk time. You're all saying such really important and specific, you know, very detailed. That's what we need this conversation to be is the on the ground and granular and real and, and current because there's changes happening all the time. And so these spotlight conversations are to really take the temperature and to take the snapshots right now 
and we look forward to having them over the course of the coming years, once or twice a year to return so that we can just have an ongoing conversation with, within the Actors Fund community and then all of you and your community. So thanks again. And I'm off to another meeting. So <laughs> everyone be well, take care, bye. And Emily, I saw your hand raised. Did you wanna uh, add something before we move on? I do really quick. Um, <clears throat> so I think that the, the word complacency was used in terms of um, forward motion. And one of the things I just wanna point out the value of everybody here <laughs> and all of the groups that are here. Um, I know dance in, part, in our vision is to combat the glorification of the starving artist. So I think that we as individuals need to fight back on that and we need to ask for what we're worth and we need to know what we're worth and we need to move away from this scarcity mentality. And, you know, I, we haven't been necessarily given the tools to do that. And we also, I mean, I talk to dancers on a daily basis who feel like they owe people something like, oh, they gave me a job, so I owe them or, oh, I, I should, I'm, I should sacrifice this because, because I'm passionate about it. Or I don't know, all of these messages that we've been given as dancers to so sacrifice ourselves and our own um, work and our pay and <laughs> our health and our well-being, all of those things. I think we need to push back on that. And I, I think that the way to do it is collectively. And so again, every single group in this meeting is a valuable resource and is something that if you are in that region, become a member or join or get on their newsletter or find out, figure out how to get involved so that we can all work on this together and push back on some of those messaging, some of the messaging, some of the, the things that are really um, what we wanna move past, right? what we don't want to go back to. Yeah. Yeah, flipping the script on the starving artist. And, you know, what does it mean to be an artist that thrives and to advocate for each other and organize together to create communities that support the well-being of, of dancers, especially those that, that come from marginalized communities. So this is our next question to the panelists and, and to all of us, you know, what lessons learned during these times of a pandemic, during these times of incredible social activism and organizing, um, you, you know, in dance and beyond dance, how, how can we move forward in 2022 to make dance spaces and communities more just, equitable and inclusive? And I'll uh, start um, as we did uh, before with, with Bonnie. Oops, you're on mute, Bunny. I, sorry, I was just typing something in just as a, as a tag along. You know, the Actors Fund some recent uh, survey showed that uh, the medium, national median income was what, $64,000 or something. But of the recipients in uh, the Actors Fund, um, uh, you know, last year, that the median uh, income amount was about 34,000. And, uh, you know, the Dance Data Project did several surveys now on um, the disparity of gender compensation, right, in our field. I mean, there's so many issues that we're trying to move forward, but I, I feel that the work that we're all doing on the ground and how we're making these issues um, just more uh, uh, available and really to just bring people to the table to be active. You know, just, I sent out on my Facebook and other social media and just uh, encouraging people to write to encourage support for our NEA and NEH uh, income funding. Uh, you know, the, the activism and advocacy for all of us in many levels is as important because as stakeholders, what happens in one area is really going to have impact on the rest of us. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. It's, um, it's, we're all connected, right? The national and the local. Um, and I, uh, how about you? Um, I, you know, I'm gonna just hop over to J uh, Janae because I know she has to leave at 11 um, and, and then we'll come back around to you, Rael. But uh, what would you like to add to this, Janae, this part of the conversation? 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's very important that, especially in this pandemic, we definitely brought to light the inequities that dancers have compared to other performers within the industry um, and in within the dance industry as well. So I think it's really important. I put this in the chat that, you know, dancers, we came together during this pandemic to help and support each other. And we have to keep that moving forward. And that means don't undercut each other for for jobs, you know, hold the standard of what a living wage is and, and um, you know, don't undercut and say, well, I can do the job for 300 when the job really should have been a thousand, right? So, you know, working and ensuring that that that's what we focus on. And also too, knowing what jobs are union and non-union. So, you know, that someone doesn't, you know, essentially deceive you and say it's non-union and it's a union production. And then you have to file a claim to get the money's due to you. So really just banding together and keeping up with education and all platforms of dance and all resources that you have and really setting the standard across the board that we won't work less for this and we're we're worth more than this so um i think that that's kind of the takeaway that i give to everybody moving forward post pandemic mm. thanks for that it reminds me of your earlier comment about uh, just dancers supporting dancers um and and you know how do we continue that in what spaces uh, exist already where this advocacy work together is happening. The union, SAG-AFTRA, um, DANK, Dancers Alliance. Um, <laughs> yes. And other alternative creative economies. I know Gustavo uh, Arts for LA really spoke to that in the conference last week. Yes, we, we strongly believe in, in, in everything that's being shared in this conversation. Uh, one of the things that just in being with, with Arts for LA now for almost three years, one of the things that I've seen and in, in folks I've worked in, in advocacy for a few years outside of arts and culture, healthcare, workforce policy, and other issues, part of what I see in arts and culture is that there's an equal need for us to do internal advocacy amongst one another as much as there is the external advocacy, the NEA, NEH, it's that both of those things need to really happen in tandem within our arts and culture field. And I agree completely with Nick, living wage, this is a key, key fight for our organization, for our field to, to truly uh, value ourselves. And I, I, I want to also share that, you know, in, you share these data points around the dance community, but it's not unique. It's, it's actually the same data for arts workers generally in Los Angeles. Uh, there was a, a report that was released by the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, uh, Make or Break, and it, it found that, you know, the, the average uh, income salary that's being made here in Los Angeles is around that Thirty-four to thirty-six thousand dollars below the living wage, and then when we look at BIPOC communities, we're making thirty percent less than our white counterparts. And if you look at the Latinx community, entry-level workers, they're actually making below a minimum wage here in Los Angeles. And so we have some real um, wage issues that, if we are talking about building a more equitable, just, inclusive sector they we need they need to be addressed because folks can't afford to to work in the arts certainly if they're um yeah they, they just can't afford to work in the arts and and i think also um just in, in thinking about you know what do we need to continue to keep a laser focus on is also equitable arts education and thinking about you know zip code still determines whether you get arts education here in Los Angeles, um, we're making progress, but we need to stay laser focused and ensure that our, uh, our students get early exposure and there's clear career pathways that have been built uh, into the sector. Uh, and just as a silver lining, I wanna share, you know, COVID-19 has also presented opportunities. Um, most recently, Governor Newsom signed Senate Bill 628, the Creative Workforce Act. Uh, Arts for LA co-sponsored this bill. California and arts advocates co-sponsored this bill. And this bill essentially is to um, create a more diverse workforce. And it includes living wage as a key principle of, um, of the program that will get developed uh, and eventually pipeline folks into the creative sector. 
So there's progress that has been made. Uh, it's because of all the advocates here, you know, with us today, uh, folks who, you know, have taken action and, and have pushed to make, make stuff change during this time. Thank you for that, Gustavo. Yeah, there's amazing headway um, being made and certainly the power of coming together. I, I see your hand up, Andrea. Would you like, we can just popcorn it now. We don't need to go in, a, in any order, please, Andrea. Yes, so the question, you know, how can we make the dance community more equitable and inclusive? The first thing for me comes to mind is, the, is our grants and the granting process. And there's several things to consider um, when talking to program officers or foundation leaders, you know, asking them to adjust the application forms to be less exhaustive. Mm -hmm. Considering a regional or national application so folks don't have to fill out 10 mm -hmm. pages here, 20 pages here, uh, intent to apply here, LOI here, you know, all these different things, like finding a way to make that cohesive. Um, having diverse panels, that actually represent the communities they're supporting, uh, allowing grants to be general operating support versus project-based, developing community connections or affinity specific, like for first-time applicants, for Latinx applicants, for queer applicants, for senior applicants, you know, really considering giving funds to re-granting programs that already exist to support small and medium uh, organizations or companies in genres outside of ballet and modern stage dance. I think that's where folks can really shift that support. And I've seen it happening in a lot of foundations that are you know, Bay Area based, but if that, that needs to happen more and it needs to happen at the larger level. So that way it can trickle down because we're already doing it in our community with regranting and holding community spaces to help each other talk about these things. But I think it has to get to that larger platform so the money can trickle down because that's where it really is it's the money that needs to move into the community we're already helping each other in so many other ways we need the financial support thank you thank you for those clear and tangible um recommendations you know for for how we can continue this work forward i see your hand uh molly and and then nick thank you um yeah so i i feel like organizations that are that are represented and collectives that are represented around the screen um have have always and especially in the last 18 months been really active listeners um and i think uh foundations have have begun to develop that skill a little more um over over the recent past but i think it's um I think organizations like ours and foundations not not snapping back um, into the way of moving forward and not continually still really listening and being willing to make adjustments and letting things go and acknowledging that we've been doing it wrong um, is 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 important in in making that that future possible um and making making that commitment as individual organizations and encouraging the the funders in our communities to to keep the um you know the the open access that has been revealed in the last um year and a half that it's very clear could have always been there mm -hmm. um there's there's no reason why it was able to open up now and it wasn't able to open up before march of 2020 so I think, um, you know, keeping that commitment to the organizations that, that do have the ability to, you know, to, to make some of those, um, those asks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for that. I, I, I've definitely also heard of fear of funder of the organizations worried that it's going to go back to the way it was and, and how, how to sustain the strides from the last year. How about you, Nick? I see your hand. Yeah, this question, um, how can we embrace lessons learned during these times moving forward to make dance spaces and communities more just, equitable, and inclusive? Uh, standards, the introduction of standards. We 
The standards that exist are largely just passed down through time. Uh, they're just understood ways of doing things. And what we, what we really need are written standards, policies, or, or rules that are, that are put into place so that it's, it's even, or at least more equitable across the board. Um, so for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, around around the, uh, early in the pandemic, when we saw gigs being rescheduled and postponed and then ultimately canceled and people were losing work and they were losing income. And then I can see in the chat lots of people putting out uh, resources for, for emergency and financial assistance. Uh, my partner at the time, who was also a dancer, we lived here together and we started to apply for them. And it was very telling how different the dance world was because while she came from the ballet dance world uh, and she could reach into her email and pull out contracts and invoices that illuminated very clearly what she earned for the last year or five years which a lot of these emergency assistance programs were asking for just to prove that you're an artist uh, i on the other hand come from the more the the african dance and street dance and modern and experimental and worked on a lot more uh, smaller projects and I I didn't have that same kind of info I had uh, email exchanges of a friend who's a choreographer saying hey do you want to work on this project here's the date here's the location we rehearse on Wednesdays are you available mm -hmm. and me saying yes that was the contract there was nothing signed there's no invoice I was paid via a personal check that I just happened to still have so it's 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 a standardization within the dance world. I think sometimes that the creativity that we use in our work bleeds and translates into how we do business, and that's really really sloppy. So so having uh, a letter of agreement, one that that all dancers use, that all choreographers have seen, that make signing on to work a very transparent and replicable process so that people know what they're signing on to they know what they're getting involved in there's an understanding from both sides what is being created in a way that allows for that transparency to exist because that's what's missing right now transparency across the board um, negotiating negotiating a lot of dancers um, and this differs depending on i think age how we're looking at these issues will register differently between different age groups. Uh, for, for instance, I'll, I'll be 38 next month. And for dancers who are 10 years in both directions and have seen this way of doing things for long enough, we're fed up with it. And we're saying, OK, things need to change. Things need to shift. Whereas I've, um, sometimes I see dancers who are older than that saying, yeah, it's been that way the whole time. Why are you making a stink about it now? Or, well, back in my day, it was harder than this, and now you're soft. And then there are dancers who are, who are much younger, who are coming into the dance world, who will say yes to anything because they don't know any better, and they're hungry for work, they want to be seen, they feel like they have to pay their dues. So there, there's an element of education and understanding. So um, that's, that's, again, what, Dan what Dank is, is striving to do is to educate is to introduce resources that enable dancers to feel empowered to make the decisions that they need to do, inform decisions about the work that they want to accept, but also informing choreographers about the information that they need to provide in order for dancers to do that. Um, Gustavo, I think, alluded to it, that it's, it's, it's bigger than, than any one of these parties. It's not just the dancers. It's not just the choreographers. It's the ecosystem as a whole how a, a work goes from the idea, oh, I want to make a piece about, to being presented on stage and all the steps that it goes through that it gets to that point, that system is flawed. And so looking at all of those pinpoints along the way and who, inter who it interacts with and, and assessing, okay, what needs to shift about that, that's going to require a lot more work than than what's happening in this room. But this is this is where it starts. This is the genesis. So, I'm glad we're here, and I'm glad for everyone who's watching, and thought. Thank you. It's really exciting to, to know that there is, you know, the one sheet out there that it starts to create this dialogue and and a, a template that individual dancers can use and 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 dance, you know, companies and collectives can can use as a as a format. And thank you so much, April. We definitely want to follow up with you on that. We have been looking into it and I think we're just hitting a snag in the road of getting um, 
closed caption. Uh, so um, thank you for, for that. Um, and Emily, I see your hands up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add a little bit to that, that list of who is in the ecosystem, <laughs> right? And so there's a lot of people in the ecosystem that we need to pay attention to um, on the funding end, on the dancer end, on the company end, on the university and education. What, what are our universities doing to educate dancers on how to write these contracts, do these negotiations? Like what, what type of business skills are actually getting into a dance education? I know I didn't have any. I was taught how to teach dance and I was taught how to dance, <laughs> right? And choreography and performance, but what type of skills was I, what, and I was taught dance history, but what what other skills was I given in my education? And, and I wasn't given any, I know some universities out there do have programs that, that include that, but so we also, yeah, there's just, there's a lot to look at when we look at that ecosystem and how, how um, again, how, how many areas that this needs to, um, we need to move the needle in a lot of areas. Yes. It's, um, it's such a great point, the education piece and what's happening in the universities. And, um, and, and before, like uh, Gustavo said, arts education is not optional, shouldn't be optional in, in our schools. And um, making sure that no matter what zip code a student is living in, that they have access to high quality arts education from the start, from jump, so that, and when they get to university that there's um, business and, and, and coaching around what does it mean to have a career and a lifetime as a working professional artist. Uh, so these are super important pieces. And I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, open up for anyone here um, uh, on the panel before we move into um, kind of our wrap up and, and Q&A. Um, all of you come from organizations that have um, provided previously and, and currently um, some amazing resources for dancers. So just wanted to invite uh, you to share. Um, I know some of you already have, but if anyone else would like to add, you know, how has or is your organization helping dancers and what resources, uh, what resources would you like to, to make sure that dance professionals know about moving forward? Or did we put it all in the chat already? <laughs> Thanks for resharing that, Nick. Yeah, that dance, that the, the Dank Resources One Sheet is just invaluable. Yes, Emily. Me again. Um, yeah, so Dancewear just launched our launched one-to-one -one sessions, and they're kind of exactly what I was talking about. Is we um, Dancewire has a marketing director, a funds development director, and a um, operations and freelance director, and we work directly with the community to help build some of those skills. So if you need assistance researching grants because you don't have any idea where to start, we can help with that. Um, on a one-to-one -one basis. If you want to, if you want help with rebranding or marketing or creating a social media content calendar, we help with that. We help just all of the things that you need to survive as a dance artist, those business entrepreneurial um, operational skills and tools is something that we do one-on-one -on, -one on demand and it's 50% off for our members. So again, our membership is really inviting people to buy in to the, the collective. We work together to move the needle on these things. Um, but and it's also available to anybody just um, on a one-off basis. So I put directly in the chat the one-to-one -one sessions. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. And I see Rael and Molly and Nick's hand. So we'll go, we'll start with Rael. You're on mute. Just before I jump to uh, my resources, I wanted to say that um, I echo almost everything everybody was saying on this panel. Um, and I think what's interesting that's happened in the past year is that communication channels have been open like never before. Um, there's been an opportunity for leaders in the art sector to sit down with their city, county, um, national 
uh, other leaders to discuss and listen and share. Um, and I think that was the first step to then moving into what Nick was talking about and providing uh, standards for best professional business um, practice. And I think we have to also understand that the dance community is broad. So the complications or the challenges we face are similar, but what a choreographer and what a dancer, their standard and business of practice, we need to find that common ground so that it works for um, each other. And that comes from clear and transparent communication, as was said. I also think one of the um, immeasurable and valuable um, assets that came out of this pandemic is collaborative opportunities um, to work towards a common goal. A dance Resource Center, as Gustavo said earlier on, works closely with other organizations because we're all limited in capacity and it is all about prioritizing. So being able to have um, relationships and partnerships um, is invaluable to how we can grow as a field and support one another. Um, and in terms of resources, so much to say, but in terms of resources, um, DRC provides uh, weekly newsletters to update the community on everything going on in the community in Los Angeles. Um, we have a dance directory uh, for our members. We have a boutique marketplace. So it was a way this came from the pandemic. We saw how quickly um, dancers were uh, navigating different revenue strategies and flows. So we implemented a marketplace for dancers, by dancers. Um, we have marketing resources available and convenings and programming. So one of our convenings or uh, programs is Day of Dancer Health, which is to um, extend career longevity, support that. We noticed from the pandemic beyond the monetary support that DRC was able to provide when we first went into the stay at home, um, stay at home order, um, there was a mental, emotional support that was needed. The community needed to feel supported by its leaders and by each other. And so coming together and having conversations like this, um, it really comes down to the will of the people. We need the community to, to engage with organizations like on this panel so that we can really um, push and move forward and evolve into a better um, structure. Thanks so much for that, Rayel. There's some great local resources um, for LA-based dancers. How about, how about you, Molly, uh, resources in the Houston area? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have a, a range of programs for both dancers and dance makers, freelance choreographers, or, um, or small to mid-sized organizations, uh, but specifically for dancers, um, we have a program called the Dancer Fund, which is just a, um, a matching program where individual dancers can apply to receive matching funds for uh, artist stipends they receive for project-based work. And it is a, a fast and easy transaction to um to submit your contract your your however you received payment um and we we match it um and so it is it is a way for dancers to um to double what they've received on a project and it also allows dancers to feel more empowered to go to a choreographer that have may that may be not having the important conversation about what you're being paid and what the expectations are both ways and it it, it gives um, especially a lot of maybe greener dancers to feel more empowered to go and say, I, I need you to fill this contract out so that I can apply to this program. Um, we, we also have a, a day of dancer health event that's happening later this year, um, as well as some, some other um, virtual workshops that are happening leading up to that. Mm -hmm. um, we have another grant program that's available to fiscally sponsored projects and organizations that is operational that also opens later this month. Um, and I'm going to drop the link to our website in there. And just because um, before moving over to you, Nick, um, I know Molly and some others here are part of Dance USA. Is there a fellowship happening again next year for dancers or are there other resources that Dance USA also is, can provide? Dance USA just, I think yesterday, announced the, the relaunching of the next round of their fellowship for artists, which I can drop in the chat as well. Um, and they, they've also done a, a series of, of webinars. Uh, there was one last week. There's one, I think, tonight in partnership with 
Dance NYC, maybe if I'm remembering it correctly. There's another one coming up in another week, um, and so I'll, I'll I'll find the link to to both of those things and share them in there. Thanks for mentioning that, Sophia. Great, thank you. And how about you, Nick? I I was curious. Can anyone um, in any any location join Dank? Yes, yes. Uh, so Dank, Dank's Dank is open to really everyone. Uh, it is it is a collective of freelance dance artists. So in order to be a member, you do have to be a dancer. But if you're not a dancer, you can still support Dank as an ally. And um, perhaps my my uh, fellow fellow Dank member slash assistant April Biggs uh, can post a link in the chat um, indicating just that. It's actually on the one sheet that's already been posted. Uh, so in addition to the links that she's been posting as far as resources, uh, there's also uh, just posted our Instagram handle, which is not just photos of dancers, but it's it's a um, it's a transparent look as to what we're working on and what we're doing uh, to garner garner traffic and interest. Um, because what what Dank is striving towards twofold is is uh, the ability to, to unionize. Uh, right now, we're really discussing uh, what's called the Pro Act, which stands for protecting uh, the right to organize. Uh, right now, there there are a couple unions that dancers could be a part of. There's SAG-AFTRA, there's AGMA, uh, but those are really tailored towards uh, larger entities of which dancers can be a part of versus individual dancers like myself, whether you're freelance or whether you're an employee. Um, allowing the dancers, allowing any, any artist, but specifically dancers, the ability to organize is the best way to, to garner bargaining rights or to institute shifts in an industry. Uh, you do that with, with numbers. When you have the numbers, then you can apply pressure. And pressure is the way to institute change in a system that doesn't work. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, there's uh, April's posting links right now. The one sheet has uh, most of this already listed, but in addition to those links, there's the Instagram handle, there's there's information on the Pro Act, and there's Dank itself. Uh, join. You, you can join anywhere you are. It's, it's primarily for for artists, dancers in the U.S., uh, but we do have discussions going on about how to support dancers from abroad, especially when they come to the U.S., mm -hmm. so that's in the making. We're always evolving. It's all member-led. Uh, we meet regularly, so um, yeah, in any way that you can, click on something, <laughs> something here in relation to us, and, uh, and get educated. Thank you. That's and Andrea, I see your hand up. How, how can dancers group or how is Dancers Group supporting dancers in the Bay Area and beyond? Yes, so we offer a variety of resources that really strive to promote and amplify the visibility and viability of dance in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that includes, I'll just name just a few um, since we're getting towards the end. Uh, our grant calendar that I spoke about before, it includes funds for a variety of opportunities that include performance projects, um, education focused activities, fellowships, professional development opportunities, tour planning, and also, you know, during this time, COVID or emergency relief. We have our weekly newsletters that go out amplifying local performances, workshops, jobs, news, other community opportunities. Um, we have our cash grant program that supports a range of individual artists and dance organizations that represent all the diversities of the Bay Area, whether that's genre of dance, ages, ethnicity, race, orientation, ability, location, cash grant really supports and attempts to support, you know, as a wide range of folks as possible. And we really take that into consideration. Um, and another thing is our in dance, uh, which used to be a monthly publication prior to the Panderosa. And it's now moved into quarterly and it's digital, it's online. So that's allowed us to grow our voices and perspectives of the writers that we can have on each publication. It's allowed us to dig deeper as a service organization to experiment with different ways of communing with, communicating with our audiences through audio experiences through a new video series that I produced called 10 and 10. 
and it's a new series that's kind of like the man on the street where you would usually walk up to somebody right after rehearsal like hey <laughs> what's going on with you how you been enjoying dance what's your favorite this like did you enjoy this performance so it's kind of moving that to a digital video format so check it out that's dancersgroup.org has all these great opportunities and resources mostly for bay area opportunities but we have included you know opportunities for folks to go out as well amazing thank you so much and i i saw bonnie that you also dropped your the link to the la dance foundation in the chat um so thanks for sharing that um did you want to just say anything about that before we we wrap up yeah, the, the key to just surviving is is just making sure that you reach out to find out what you want to know and what you need to know. And the resources are there. Uh, that's sort of the biggest takeaway from, from everyone that I've talked to about how they have survived and are moving forward right now. The other big takeaway that's still a question mark is in speaking with my our uh, presenters, mostly here and in, in New York, it's still an unknown. You know, if if they're gonna if audiences really feel comfortable to actually come into a very small space and sit together, um, you know, several of ours in Southern California did quite well with the outdoor performances. But now that we're shifting in, I'm actually going to my first indoor dance performance in another week. Um, and I'm going to double mask, but you know we we need to to get people back in the seats because without having the presenters booking our talent, it's harder than for these companies to survive, right? Thank you. Thanks for that. Yes, we're still very much in transition, certainly, and um, still lots of unknowns. Um, this is beautiful to have this conversation where we can actually uh, actively co-create or set some intention about what we would like it to look like and take active steps towards that. I'll just um, put this in the chat, Dancers Alliance, they really wanted to be here today. They just um, weren't available, but this is another uh, resource of, of dancers, um, mostly non-union dancers organizing um, to protect and, and uphold um, you know, fair wages, just wages, and um, and safe working conditions for dancers. So I'll just pass it over to my colleague Nicole for some closing announcements and to see if we have just one or two minutes for some questions. Uh, so I'll drop I'll drop in the chat some links and information again. Uh, you know, reminders about some of the services available at the Actors Fund for dancers and. Specifically, our dancer info session is a great way to, you know, connect with us and learn all about those things. Um, we had uh, some questions in the chat here. One of them, I think we might have touched on a little bit, but if anyone wants to speak more specifically to it, especially as it relates to the resources, some of you mentioned. Um, someone was saying, let's see here, um, how how are those of us, you know, indie artists, they're saying um, with no sort of generational wealth, you know, supposed to be able to re-enter the field when they feel like they've been left behind. So this is definitely something we've touched on and spoken about. Um, you know, they did, they're saying they didn't make a livable, livable wage before in dance. And of course it's, you know, even that much more difficult now with the pandemic. Um, and then they're wondering if organizations are interested in nurturing, you know, viable, livable, equitable dancer career pathways, specifically non-admin pathways as well. Well, great, great questions. And um, this last one of, of nurturing viable, livable, equitable dance career pathways seems like the, such the heart of, of thriving as dancers. Yes, Andrea, would you like to speak to this? Yes, I was just typing in to kind of answer that question. I was gonna say, yes, I've seen programs develop that are specific to work in the theater, um, that's specific to lighting that's specific to sound that's specific to house managing that's specific to artists in schools being developed um so there are options outside of admin work because that is not always you know where some people's skill set lies and i think it's really taking the time to really look around and seeing where those programs are and really jumping on as many newsletters as you can to see where the opportunities are for dance mission, for ODC, for dancers group, for all the other, you know, 
big venues and small venues for Z space for, you know, all these different things and not necessarily limiting yourself to just dance in this super tiny way, but like opening it up to see at see and learn the different aspects. There's filmmaker training, learning how to be a production assistant. So that way you're expanding your view on not just performing dance, but viewing it and how to shape it. Hmm. Those are some great, great options to explore. And, um, you know, if uh, speaking to the, the participant that wrote this and to all, all of us on the call, if you ever just want a sounding board, someone to talk to about what are my um, career pathways and, and options you're considering, you can certainly reach out to Nicole or I to set up a career counseling session and we could talk through more what that looks like for you specifically um, based on your interests, skills, values, um, and, and passions and help you figure out um, a, a pathway that, that feels right and fits well for you. And Sophia, can I add something here? Yes, please. Uh, I just wanna share that uh, arts, I, I don't know where this attendee is based or and if they're based in Los Angeles or not, but um, Arts for LA is preparing to launch what we call the Creative Jobs Collective. Uh, and this collective is, a, it, it has ambitious, it's a 10 year initiative that will pipeline 10,000 youth, young adults from underrepresented communities into the creative workforce. It will advocate for a living wage here in Los Angeles. And it'll, it'll set diversity metrics and ensure that we're pushing for those diversity measures in the region. But as a part of this whole process, Arts for LA is the initial step will be to landscape all of the creative career pathway programs that exist here in Los Angeles and actually map it all out. And so that's the first couple of quarters of the work is, and so if, if there is interest in anything like that from the attendee, uh, they can sign up uh, for our newsletter. Uh, and of course that will keep folks updated on that, on that program. Thank you so much. What great resources. This has been a wealth of information. I uh, really appreciate all the panelists for your time, energy, uh, your love, your, your comments, your vision, visionary thinking around this. Thank you to all the participants for your active participation and questions and comments. Really, thank you so much for, um, for being here today and, um, and joining us for this conversation. So with uh, no further ado, thank you so much, Megan, and to all of you. Uh, for being here. Uh, we'll um, keep you posted. We'll send some of these resources out in a follow-up thank you email and um, hopefully get that recording ready to go in, in a week or two to be able to share that as well. Thank you again so much. Take good care. We'll be in touch. Hope to see you soon again.